Hey folks, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study at Central Baptist Church of Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Uh, tonight, <clears throat> as you can see, we're coming to you from our library that's on the uh, second floor of our educational building. Uh, the, the folks have done a great job in keeping the library up. If you get a chance, stop on by. Lots of uh, wonderful uh, reference material that you can find here to use as you study your Bible. Uh, and uh, have a children's section over there as well that, uh, that you can uh, bring the kids up and uh, find some good reading for them. So next time you're here, stop on by. Uh, if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be... Uh, uh, looking at the weapons of our warfare uh, this evening. Now, as you find that passage in your Bible, um, you know, think about a, a time in your life where you have observed a bully. Maybe at, at times in your life when you were younger or growing up that uh, may, maybe you had to contend with a bully when you were in school. Uh, maybe it was somebody who pushed you around and, and, and struck fear in, in the hearts and the lives of so many people. Uh, so I ask you this question, why is it that you dislike a bully? What, what is it that, that makes you uh, distasteful towards them? Well, I think if, uh, if you could answer that question, most people would say, uh, well, because they, uh, uh, they try to control by fear, they, they try to you know, push you around, and actually at times maybe even uh, use physical violence. So you know, as, you, as you thought about that person that you had observed maybe being a bully in the past, uh, what are ways in which uh, Satan is the biggest bully of all? Uh, when we apply those things that we just thought about to, to Satan, about you know wanting to control, you know wanting to uh, you know, have their way, and, and pushing people around, and you know, almost to the point of uh, of physical violence. I mean, you know, that Satan kind of fits that picture uh, when we look at it. Well, yeah. You know, most of us, when we have contended with a bully before, there was uh, somebody who actually had an opportunity to put that bully in his place, you know, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, it didn't always happen to ha have a, a physical attribute to it, but sometimes it did. Uh, many of us could probably remember back to the time when uh, somebody stood up to the bully and, uh, and, and things changed, for, at least for them, from that point forward. Well, you know, what do we do? When we're talking about Satan being one of the biggest bullies of all, one of the things we have to understand is that there are some weapons of our warfare. Uh, a moment ago, I told you that's what we're going to be looking at tonight out of the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at what our weapons of warfare against the biggest bully of all, uh, who is Satan, we'll look and see uh, yeah, what we've got there. Now, if, uh, like I say, go ahead and turn with me if you would, if you haven't already, to... Uh, the book of, uh, of uh, 2 Corinthians uh, in chapter 10, and uh, we'll begin reading at verse 1. It says, uh, now, I, uh, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the, the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who is in present, uh, who in presence uh, am lowly among you, but being absent, I am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I, I am present, I may not be bold uh, with that confidence by which I intended to be bold against some who think of, of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though uh, we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now verse 4 says, For the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and, and every uh, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready uh, to punish all disobedience when your obedience uh, is fulfilled. Now, I, I want to go back because I know that, that for a lot of folks, when you looked at those, those first couple of passages, they, uh, they almost sounded like a tongue twister that you would try to say when you were younger. So let me give that to you in a different translation. If you go back to verse 1, it says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, I who am, am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. And now, verse 2 kind of gives the context of that. It says, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count uh, showing against some who uh, suspect us of walking according to the flesh. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against the flesh. And I think that is extremely important. The Bible tells us uh, so many times and in so many ways, you know, our battle is not with flesh and blood. Um, you know, I have stated that, that through the, the pandemic and the way that society has, uh, has gone forward today, you know, we seem to be busy warring with one another. Uh, I know that's true with, within so many organizations. That's true within the church. That's true within your workplace. That's true within you know, the, the convention. We're too busy you know, bickering and arguing <coughs> excuse me, and fussing with one another uh, that we're not being about the Father's business in the manner uh, in which the Lord would want us to. So you know, even though this word tells us that we have to walk in the flesh, you know, we don't walk according to the flesh. And that's what Paul is, is getting, you know, or wanting to get across uh, to his readers uh, in these passages. So in our text, Paul is teaching believers about loving accountability and spiritual warfare. Uh, I, would, I would ask this question, if you were able to be present with us this evening, I would ask uh, if you believe uh, that there is spiritual warfare, number one, and if you believe that uh, spiritual warfare uh, is taking place uh, in, in society, in your life, in your families, within your churches, and uh, you know, within your workplace, wherever you may be, uh, I believe that, that an overwhelming majority would say, yes, there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place in, in the hearts and lives of people today. The question is, who is winning? What, what side is winning out, the carnal side or the spiritual side. Now, as brothers and sisters in Christ, it is important for us to hold one another accountable in important areas of our, our spiritual lives. And that is what uh, verses 1 and 2 of our passage are speaking of. You know, it's, it, that's what friends do. A friend is that person who can go uh, and, and tell you when you're out of line. And, and although you may not like it, I'm not saying that that's always received the best, but because of your love for them, because of your friendship uh, with that person, you will evaluate what they say. You will take a, a look at your life, and you will actually uh, look to see if, uh, if, if anything that they are saying uh, about you is correct. Are you really walking uh, in the Word? Now, as we were over in, uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians, remember, it was a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the love chapter. We were talking about how is it that the Lord would act and react, you know, and, and when you begin to think about what you're doing, you know, we talked about the love chapter uh, being a litmus test of how we act and, and, and what we do. So, you know, remember the, the passage, love is patient, love is kind, love is long-suffering. It goes on, it gives this great list of, of attributes of love. So yeah, you, we probably heard that expression before that says, well, when you go to somebody, you go to somebody in love. You go to them because you truly have a genuine concern, a spiritual concern about what they're doing, about what is taking place. Uh, and it's because of your heart, not that you're going to them because you want to get even with them, not because you know, you're, you're trying to point something out or, or make it some uh, big known thing that, that would actually... Uh, hurt or destroy somebody's reputation. Folks, that's not the way things work. Uh, it, uh, that's not the way the Bible says they should work. That's actually how they do work. But when, you know, when it comes to it, you know, people have this tendency to go and talk about people behind their, their, their back rather than going to them. And sometimes it's simply a matter of preference. Folks, let me tell you right now, that is one of the biggest uh, tools that Satan uses in the lives of believers to try to separate them, to try to keep the gospel from going forward. The question is, are we participating in what it is that he is doing? Because the Lord told us we have some weapons of warfare uh, to combat these things. Now, you know, we were talking about you know, that accountability. So why is it important uh, <coughs> to, to approach somebody with that meekness and that gentleness that Christ would? When you think about it, as you read the, the word, you know, Christ came up against many people that were sinners. Uh, that he knew. I mean, just like he you know, he knows your sin and my sin, he knew the sin that was taking place in their lives. And, and man, I can think of examples throughout the Word of God where Christ approached somebody with meekness and gentleness uh, as he dealt with them. I mean, one of the, the particular passages that, uh, well, I'll give you two of them uh, that come to my mind. One of those is when he was at the, the, had an encounter with the woman at the well. And remember, he had that opportunity to uh, speak to her in regard uh, to salvation, 
And, and he didn't say anything really about her life or her lifestyle or anything at, at that particular moment. And uh, so Jesus, you know, kind of pushed the matter and he said, well, well go get your husband. And, and of course, the lady you know, in her embarrassment, you know, you know, said to him, said, oh, well, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus at that particular point, which was a moment of truth, a moment of honesty, but it was also done with meekness and gentleness, said to the woman this. He said, you have well said that you don't have a husband. You've already had several, and the one that you're with now is not your husband. So Jesus never gave anybody a pass on sin. But by the same token, he didn't browbeat them. He didn't go behind their back. He handled the situations with meekness and with gentleness. Now, <laughs> the other example that I was thinking of is when uh, the lady who was, was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, uh, you know, as you read that, you, you know that this was all a setup. This was all to try to find something against Jesus. Uh, but they, they catch this woman in adultery. They drag her into the presence of Jesus. Uh, and in their trickery, they're trying to, they told Jesus, said, the law said that we're supposed to stone this woman, but what do you say? Uh, and at that particular point, Jesus didn't really say anything, but it says he stooped down and he began to write uh, on the ground. And it says that as he wrote on the ground, it said they kind of began to drop their rocks and they walked away, uh, beginning with the eldest and going down uh, to the least or the youngest of these. Now, nobody knows, uh, according to the scripture, the scripture doesn't tell us what it was that Jesus wrote on the ground, but what it was had to be something that was very convicting to the lives of those who were around her. You know, Jesus, uh, you know, it is presumed, once again, you know, we don't know this for a fact, it is presumed that what Jesus was writing in the sand were the sins of those people that were standing around the lady. They're saying, you are, you, you are bringing her into my presence calling her a sinner, but have you looked at your own life? Have you looked at the sins in your own life? And obviously, you know, there are things in, in everybody's life, everybody, every single person, that you wouldn't want other people to know about. You know, whether it was a, a, some sin that you had in the past that, that you've already uh, you know, confessed before the Lord, you repented of it, you have been forgiven, you certainly wouldn't want other people to know uh, what you had done because it would be an embarrassment. It wouldn't be showing forth uh, your walk with the Lord. Um, so we all have those areas and those things that we wind up uh, hiding because we don't want other people to know about them. Well, folks, let me make you a promise right now. Just as in the two examples that I gave you, Christ already knows about those things. Uh, and, and he wants you to uh, repent from them or turn away from them. He wants you to confess them to him uh, so that, that, that your life may not be a life under conviction of wrongdoing. Uh, and it, it needs to be handled with love. Now, when we bring that uh, into our personal relationships, there are things that you see in other people that you know are not spiritual, you know are not pleasing to God. And maybe because your friendship or relationship with them, uh, you know for a fact that these are things that are taking place. These are things uh, that are happening in their life that are contrary to God's word and contrary to a, a, a good walk with him. So, you know, in our life, we should be convicted enough because of our love for that person to go to them, to approach them, to say, hey, look, you know, this is not right. What's taking place and what you're doing is not right when it comes down to this particular area. Now, sometimes that's well received and sometimes it's not. Uh, I know people have said, well, I've lost you know, friends over doing that. Well, you did the right thing because you were trying to uh, prevent something worse from happening to them down the road. You were trying to be lovingly accountable to them in the same manner in which Jesus was. So when we think about this, uh, this loving and, and gentle accountability and loving and, and gentle approach, do you believe that that is uh, a necessary role in discipleship? You know, that's one of the big things that we've talked about. Jesus told us that we are to go out and make disciples of the whole world. And discipleship is, is going beyond pointing them in the direction of salvation. You know, when a person accepts Jesus, they should be a disciple of his, meaning a follower of his. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people will call a believer a disciple because of its, its true nature of, of definition, a follower of Christ. Well, you know, too many times we sit back and let it go at somebody accepted Christ, but are we really following him in our day-to-day -day life? Are we into the scriptures? Are we making application 
uh, of the scriptures in our lives so that it reflects Christ's love and his nature and his character to the world that's around us. You know, if we just go out and be mean and nasty towards people, that is not the character of Christ. That is not what, you know, what he said that we should do. Um, did he just walk away from sinners? No, he didn't. You know, he held them accountable for their sin. Now, he did it in a loving way. He did it in a gentle way. He did it in, in a way that the people that were being approached understood that there was a great love that Christ had for them uh, you know, as, he, as he pointed out the sin that was taking place. Now, I mentioned before as we were talking about this thing called spiritual warfare. Go back and look at, uh, at, at chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And then go on to verse 4. Verse 4 says, <clears throat> For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So when we think about spiritual warfare, we are giving, uh, we're given some weapons by which to combat that. Um, yeah, I don't want you to turn there. I'm going to read uh, some passages for you out of uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 tells us this. It says, <clears throat> it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness uh, in, in heavenly places. Now, when you look at that list uh, in those particular passages, does it say anything about warring against our neighbor? No, it says that you, it, it is extremely important that you and I put on the whole armor of God, which we read about in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Um, you know, it, it gives us the, our, our tools for battle, and I've said many, many times if you look at that, most of those, those tools uh, that we use are defensive. They're, de they're, de they're designed to protect us. There is one offensive weapon that we use. In other words, uh, you know, to go, you know, you've heard of offense and defense. You know, if, if you're an athlete, offense is when you've got the ball. Defense is when you're uh, trying to, you know, to get it back or trying to keep the other team from scoring. So the only offensive weapon listed in Ephesians chapter 6 is, is the Word of God. That is our offensive weapon. But, but it, it puts into perspective the spiritual warfare. You know, it says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That means people. That means our brothers and sisters. That means the, the, the people that we come in contact with every day. Our battle is not against them. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Folks, I believe with all my heart, if we, could see the, if we could see the spiritual realm around us with our own eyes, it would scare us to death. You know, folks, there are demons. Uh, there are angels. There is spiritual uh, battle. There's spiritual warfare that is being waged in your life. Satan does not want you to be uh, a good witness for the Lord if you're saved. And if you're not saved, he doesn't want you to hear the word of God. He doesn't want you to be exposed in any way to any of that uh, so that the Holy Spirit may work in your life, giving you an opportunity for salvation. Satan doesn't want that. He battles against that. Folks, right now, if you, whether you believe it or not, there is a battle for your eternal soul that is going on in this very moment. Good versus evil. You know, uh, our, our Lord versus Satan. Heaven versus hell, and and there is there's all kind of tactical things that are taking place on both sides to draw you and to woo you over to that side. So it's being put into perspective in Ephesians chapter six. Our battle is not against each other; it's not against flesh and blood, but it is against the, the those spiritual the spiritual host of wickedness that's all around us. So keep that in mind. Now, there's another verse that, uh, that, that I want to uh, point your uh, attention to, uh, which comes out of uh, 1 John 
4, 4. 1 John 4, 4 says, you are of God. Now, this is talking about believers. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, that is talking about the believer. That is talking about those who have Christ in them. Notice that verse again. It says, uh, uh, you are uh, of God, little children, and have overcome them, overcome the evil, overcome you know, all the, the, that unspiritual host around you. Why verse 4 of, of uh, John 4, 4 says this, it says, because he who is in you, which is Christ, is greater than he who is in the world, and that is Satan. So you know what? We have all of the tools that we need to be able to live a life uh, that is pleasing to our Father which is in heaven. The question is, do we utilize the tools? Folks, it doesn't do any good if you have this, this whole toolbox full of tools and never use them. You, know, there, you have this arsenal, but you have this arsenal for a reason. You know? And when we think about uh, today, even though uh, we, you know, we, we have to walk in the flesh, you know, uh, we're not to wage spiritual war according to the flesh. Yeah, you know, and, and let me give you an example of that. We know what it means uh, to be uh, in the flesh or acting or reacting in the flesh. It's just like when something makes you mad, <coughs> you might want to you might want to fire back. You might want to get in an argument. How many times has there been uh, the expression that that often? Things that you know that are said in the in the heat of the moment or the heat of passion, and then you find you're having to go back and apologize for the things that you said because you really didn't mean them. You, you mean them. You said them, you know, out of haste. You said them in a manner by which to get back at that person or to to cut them deeply. Um, you, that that's a fleshly action, and we're not to walk in the flesh. We're to walk in the spirit. Why are we to walk in the Spirit, and can we win that battle? Sure. How do I know that? Because of the verse we just read, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he, Jesus Christ, that is in you than he, Satan, that is in the world. So in spiritual warfare, uh, we have an ally who is greater than our enemy. Uh, you know, which is greater, you know, God Almighty or Lucifer? God Almighty is. He's proven that through his power. He's done things and continues to do things that Satan cannot do. And they are in a battle for your soul. So I ask you this question, which one is winning? You know, now when we think about it, you know, Paul talks about those weapons uh, of our warfare. Uh, and he means that in, in verse 4, these are the things that, that we are supposed to use in that battle. Now a moment ago, I mentioned that in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, uh, we read those weapons. We read what they are. In fact, let me go ahead and go over uh, to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse uh, 16, and, and it tells us that. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, beginning with verse 16, uh, actually tells us this. It says, above all, uh, taking the, the shield of faith uh, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, did you see that? That is a defensive weapon. It says, here's something that we need. It says, the shield of what? Faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you take that shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one as they're fired after you. That was verse 16. Verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6 says, and take the helmet of salvation. Yeah, a helmet is designed to protect you. And the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. There's that offensive weapon that I mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the shield and the helmet are defensive. The sword is an offensive weapon. Now, if you were like I was when you were growing up, you, know, you had these things called sword drills. Uh, do you remember those? What was a sword drill? It was how, fi how fast you could find a passage that your leader would give you in the word of God, designed to, to help you be able to navigate your way through the Word of God. And we called those sword drills because the Bible is referred to as your offensive weapon, your sword, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 17. And then in verse 18, he goes on to say, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful uh, to this end with, with all uh, uh, perseverance and supplication 
for all the saints. So th in that particular passage, now it is, it, it is being, th those weapons of war are being listed. Now, when we think about those, you know, too many times we don't want to consider those things as, uh, as weapons, and we don't really want to consider ourselves as being uh, in the midst of warfare. And folks, that is another great tool of the devil. If he can distract us from us knowing what's really going on and taking place in our lives, we will be busy uh, <clears throat> bickering and arguing and fighting and walking in the flesh with those in our lives, and we will never come around to spiritual thinking. Uh, folks, I believe with all my heart Satan is, is using those things uh, to kill families, you know, to, to, to hurt the cause of Christ, to destroy churches, and, and it's even been heightened uh, as we've come through this, this time of COVID. Folks, let me encourage you and urge you as strongly as possible not to allow that happen. Do not be walking in the flesh. Your battle is not with flesh and blood, but it is against the uh, the, the principalities and the rulers of darkness according to the word of God. So I didn't make this up. This is not coming from Pastor Roy. This is coming straight out of the word of God. Don't fall for the fleshly actions that Satan wants us to fall into. You know, when we think about our, our weapons, you think about those, the, those weapons of our warfare. You know, do you think about the fact that those have divine power? God wants you to to utilize those, uh, those, uh, those weapons of warfare listed in Ephesians 6 to not only protect yourself, but also to have a difference in the kingdom offensively as you use the word of God. So you know, in what ways must we use these weapons? When you think about those things, you know, how you, you've heard the list of, of weapons that we have against uh, you know, the unspiritual things. How are you utilizing those in your life, uh, rather than becoming a victim of the flesh, how are you utilizing the things that God has given you? We've said many times as we study the Bible, we need to look for uh, the things that we see in the Word of God as the Holy Spirit brings them into our knowing, but it's not just enough to know them. We need to apply them. We need to make application of these things in our lives. So maybe this was the first time that you ever heard about the fact that you have uh, some some weapons to use in spiritual warfare. Well, now it's about applying them and using those weapons in your life to be exactly what God wants you to be. Now, in verses four and five uh, of, of our text, there was an interesting word that was mentioned, and it, and it was spiritual strongholds. Look at verse four. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty uh, in God for pulling down strongholds. What are those spiritual strongholds? Those, those areas in your life where uh, maybe uh, uh, Satan has gotten a hold of you and, and you just you don't feel like you can get deliverance. There, there are areas that, that whether that deliverance has not uh, come to you, uh, maybe, maybe we like it. Maybe we enjoy that particular area and it's become a stronghold uh, in our life. You know, those, those spiritual strongholds that people struggle with today. And I mean, you know, you, most of us know some of the simple uh, applications. You know, maybe, maybe somebody struggles with things like alcohol. Maybe somebody struggles with, uh, you know, their mouth and, and what they say. Uh, and, and you're being convicted about it. And, and, you know, you've maybe made some, some positive changes in your life for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of our Lord. But, boy, there's a couple you just struggle in. And as I mentioned them, you know what they are in your personal life right now. So as you think about those things, you know, Paul says uh, yeah, there's certain things that can happen to those strongholds when you use the weapons of our warfare. And what did that verse 4 say? It says that those strongholds can be pulled down. You know, when we think about the fact that particularly, you know, as a pastor, you, know, you look and try to see, you know, what is Satan doing in the hearts and lives of the people uh, that, that you pastor within your church? What is he doing within the church? And folks, I'm telling you right now, he is trying to destroy people. He is trying to de destroy any semblance of anything that can go forward, any witness for, you know, for our, our, our Holy Father. He doesn't want any of those things. And you know, it even goes on and it talks about in these passages that we're looking at today, it talks about bickering. It talks about fussing. It talks about these strongholds. And uh, 
Satan will take and use worldly arguments and he will use lofty opinions as weapons against us and our knowledge of God. And he will put people in place to bring those things about. You, know, you could probably, as you've heard that, you've probably thought of examples of those things as they've happened in your life, in your workplace, in your family, and, and even in your church. You've seen those things take place. Now, as we study our Bible, I've always asked you to look for uh, a, a command to obey. You know, one of the it doesn't always come up, but there are things that we can find in there that are commands that we are to obey. Uh, you know, so as a command to obey in our passage uh, this evening, why must we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? That's what we've learned in our work. What does it mean to take a thought captive? It means to ponder. It means to not allow your mouth to get in gear before your brain does. It means not allowing yourself to get ahead of the Holy Spirit because when somebody says something, every ounce of you wants to have that uh, snide or subtle comeback that is designed to maybe cut that person and you know in your heart you're not supposed to do that. You know you shouldn't say that. Yeah, Those are the times when yeah, you knew it. We've said it. I said it just a few moments ago that what happens is you wind up going back and saying, hey, you know what? A little earlier we were talking about some things and I got mad and I said some things I shouldn't have said. Why did you say some things you shouldn't have said? Because you did not take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Because if you would have paused for the moment, the Holy Spirit was convicting your heart. The Holy Spirit was saying, I don't think I'd say that. I don't think I would do that. Yeah, it'd be good for you to change the subject. Don't, don't say or do something you're going to regret because if you have a biblical worldview and you are following the Lord and Jesus that is within you is greater than he that is within the world, then he was telling you, don't say that, don't do that. And too many times we are not allowing our thoughts to be captive, to be sifted through the Word of God, to be sifted through the things we know. You know, I said a moment ago, love is one of those. When we sift it through the love chapter is what we're going to say or do. Is it patient? Is it kind? Is it loving? Is it long-suffering? Most of the time, our initial thought is no, 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 and no. So if they're all no's, then you, you probably need to step back and evaluate the situation that you might truly be an, an example of what God wants you to be. Not just like a gunslinger that you say the first thought that comes out of, your, uh, out of your thoughts or out of your mouth. That's not taking every thought captive. And that is what we've been encouraged to do uh, in our passages today. Take them captive. Sift them through the Word of God. Sift them through uh, the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives before we act on them. How many times have we been in circumstances or situations that said, man, I tell you, if I could turn back the clock, if I could turn back time, I never would have done this. I never would have said this. I never would have created this action because with those actions, there are also consequences. So as we think about those things uh, this evening, what are some key areas that each of us are holding on to uh, in our lives? Or what areas maybe that we see in the hearts and lives of friends where we are holding each other accountable in our spiritual walk? Okay, think about that for a moment. You know, what are some key areas that we're holding each other accountable in our spiritual walk? That's one of the things I love about, uh, our, you know, particularly one of our small groups is that when you come together and you have that, that friendship and kinship in Christ, uh, you're not an island to yourself. We are doing life together. And when, when somebody gets out of line with what the Word of God says, if you love that person, you love them enough that you go to them and say, this is not spiritual, this is not biblical, what's taking place, uh, what is going on? But remember, you have to do that with gentleness and kindness and with love, but yet you still, just in the same manner that Jesus did, you, you, know, you don't give a pass uh, on the sin. So how are we holding each other accountable in our spiritual walk and, and, and you know, you got to think, why is that important? It is important because it shows how we love one another. You know? So how can we use the weapons of our warfare that we have discovered through our, uh, our passages this evening to help one another in our struggles against the enemy? How can we do that? You know, we look around, folks. I can tell you right now, there are people that are struggling uh, with the enemy. There's spiritual warfare that is taking place. 
probably in a greater way than I have seen in my lifetime. How are we helping people using the weapons of our warfare, not, not carnality as the word says, but our weapons of spiritual warfare listed in Ephesians 6, not only to protect ourselves, but to help others, okay? You know what we need to do? We need to pray uh, th th that the mighty spiritual weapon of prayer, which is a big one, uh, we need to pray that, that, that right now that, that those people in our lives, maybe somebody that's already come to our mind, maybe somebody the Holy Spirit put in our mind, uh, somebody that we know who is in an intense spiritual warfare right now, how can we come to their aid? How can we utilize uh, the tools that God has given us to come by their side, to step in, to, to help them, to be accountable one to another? I hope and pray that as God has given you that person that you will pray for them not only uh, in just a few moments now, uh, but, uh, but also as, as the week passes on, how's God wanting to use you in their life, okay? Uh, before I close this out in prayer, I want to go ahead and give you our Bible readings uh, for this week. This week we'll actually be uh, reading passages from uh, uh, 2 Corinthians through, uh, uh, actually 2 Corinthians uh, 12 through Galatians chapter 3. Uh, next, yeah, for this week, starting if, if you're you know, doing it by the week and you're using uh, Wednesday night as, as your night or Thursday anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, start right there, read through Galatians chapter 3, and although that sounds like a lot, that's only five chapters, one chapter uh, each night, and you got two days of the week where there's some fluff in there. So uh, just asking you to read those five, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 through Galatians chapter 3. Now next week, our topic is going to be crucified with Christ, uh, and that will come out of Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. Now, before I close in prayer, just a couple of quick announcements. Don't forget, we have a call conference this coming Sunday, uh, immediately uh, after the service for the purpose of calling an interim uh, music director. Uh, we do have uh, information out in our narthex as well as uh, in our uh, right outside our offices here. Um, there's a resume and the uh, proposal that uh, that's coming as a motion from our personnel team. Uh, if you've got any questions, please contact uh, uh, the personnel team, and you can reach them at this email address. It's personnel, uh, it's P-E-R-S-O-N, I think it's N-E-L, one N. Okay, anyway, personnel at oakridgecbc.org. Or you could call the church office, and we'll try to get those questions answered for you. Also, our Sunday schedule, don't forget, we have Sunday school at 9.30 a.m. for adults uh, and children, and uh, at 10 a.m. for youth. Uh, Awana uh, will be Sunday at 5.30, and uh, we have an adult Bible study and uh, youth on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock p.m. So that's letting you know kind of where we are uh, as we're uh, uh, trying to make our comeback from covid and uh, once again, folks, listen, please be faithful to give. If you're not from our church, be faithful to the church that you attend uh, because the Lord wants to bless you. It's not just about keeping the lights on and the, the air conditioning and the heat going. It's so that God can bless you. Be faithful uh, to return the tithe that he's asked us to, uh, to return. Here at Central Baptist, several ways you can do that online. You can drop it by the church during office hours. You can catch the offering plate as it comes around. Uh, or you can uh, you can set it up in multiple ways. If you have questions about that, give us a call, and uh, we can let you know a little bit more there. So I just pray that you're going to have a great, great week. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you right now, we're so grateful and thankful for the fact that you give us tools for the spiritual warfare that is, is in among us and around us. Lord, I pray that if we don't see the spiritual warfare, that you will give us spiritual eyes to see uh, where Satan is trying to destroy us and trying to destroy you, trying to destroy your testimony, trying to destroy the church. And Lord, help us to truly be uh, in, in a mode by which not only we can defend ourselves through the tools that you have provided us, but Lord, that also we might use the offensive uh, weapon that you've given us, which is the sword, your word, to combat that spiritual uh, warfare in and, and around us. Uh, Lord, once again, we just ask for your leadership and your guidance in all that we do that we might truly magnify you. Lord, watch over us. Bring us back again at an appointed time where we can just gather around your word to love on each other and love on you. 
And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I pray that you're going to have a great week. And I pray that God's going to send you to somebody who needs a word of encouragement. And may you be that word of encouragement for them through God's word. Be alert. Beware. Because you're in a spiritual battle. Make sure you got the right uniform on. We'll see you Sunday. God bless.